Hello everybody and welcome back to the second video in the Winner in a Week sub-series on bet types, moves, and pop manipulation. My name is Dylan and in this video we'll be looking primarily at pop manipulation strategies for both pre-flop and post-flop play. We'll take a look at bet sizing for pot limit games and this will be especially important for you future pot limit Omaha players out there and also gives you a good understanding in general of pot odds as such and the odds that you're given your respective opponent or opponents both pre-flop and post-flop. We'll look at quite a few tables that I've created for you guys that show you the probability of hitting a playable or profitable flop. We'll also take a look at especially c-betting on the flop and go into pot odds analyses both for 2-bet and 3-bet pots where you're the c-better yourself or someone c-betting into you. And finally I think we'll take a look at an expected value calculator for pushes on both the flop and the turn and the respective equity you need and also fold equity to make certain moves that you may or may not be aware of. But before we get there I want to briefly review what we saw in the first video and as stated before, a one bet in online poker terms is of course just posting the big blind. A two bet is the first raise preflop. And the general rule that we gave you guys for that is in concerning bet sizing always four times the big blind plus one per limper. Three betting is in a re-raise preflop. And that again is then three times the open raise plus one per cold caller. And 4-betting and 5-betting, of course, is then the re-raise, a re-re-raise and re-re-re-raise. And here we gave as a general tip 2.5 to 3.5 times the 3-bet amount, plus 1 per 3-bet caller, if that is your case. And as always, never forget the principle that any time, any given move, a call, a bet, or a raise will commit more than half of your stack. It's no longer, in most cases... Uh, a scenario where you're considering a simple call, bet, or, or raise, you're considering either pushing or folding. Always have that in your mind. Uh, it's very, very important. You never want to just make a bet that's going to cut you in half only to fold on the following street. That's just really bad play in general. So if it's good enough to call, if it's good enough to bet, and it's going to commit half your stack, sometimes in some scenarios, as we mentioned in the first video, even a third of your stack, go ahead and push get fold equity on your side and make that strong move in that very street like I said you don't want to be in a situation where you make a move whatever call bet or raise only to let the hand go in the following street or following two streets we also looked at yeah of course limping um, being aware of players limp call limp raise stats isolation raises um, both for limpers and open raises. We looked at cold calling, of course, just calling somebody's two bet, so called flat calling or calling open. We looked at squeezing, very, very important topic. Basically, one open raiser, one cold caller, and you three bet, i.e., squeeze. Uh, we talked about maintaining initiative, keeping initiative on your side. And then, yeah, of course, we looked at the different pot odds analyses, bet sizing calculators, etc. Lines of play post flop, especially balancing deception, um, donk bets, basically leading into a pot when you weren't the last pre flop aggressor. We looked at uh, bluffs post flop, also long ball bluffs. We looked at semi bluffs, where you have a lot of equity in your hand, but you don't have a made hand, and you make a better raise. We looked at floating in quite yeah, okay, not great detail, but we looked at floating in general. And we also look at block uh, block bets. Basically betting again, especially on the river, a third or half pot, in order not to be bluffed off your hand. That very often happens, of course, out of position. That should be very clear to all of you at this point. If it's not, definitely watch the first video again before you continue on with this one. But if that is clear for you guys in principle then I'd like to get into our outline and kick it off here with pot manipulation strategies the first quote I have here for you guys point one 
small pots with small hands, big pots with big hands. Okay, what is a big hand? Is a big hand an overpair on a two-suited board? Hell no. <laughs> is a big hand an overpair on a non-suited rainbow board? Hell no. Is a pair of aces on a two, five, ten offsuit board a big hand? Hell no. Okay, I am stating this over and over again for one reason. And one reason alone. Big pots with big hands refers to hands, i.e. big hands, being two pair or better on the flop. Over pairs can go south very, very quickly when your opponents have flopped two pair or better. And again, cold callers will very often have those small and mid pockets, and you're going to very often be in a situation where uh, you're way ahead or way behind with that over pair. Uh, another question is, you know, you've got ace king, you flop uh, four nine king board offsuit in a four way pot. Is that a big hand for you? No, it is not. It's a good hand, but it's not a big hand. And if you get a lot of action with your over pairs, with your top pair, top kicker type hands, you need to be thinking that somebody may have flopped that set flopped that two pair, flopped that really strong draw, even flopped a completed uh, straight or flush, as unlikely as that is statistically seen. It does happen, uh, especially in multi-way pots. You have to be careful with your over pairs and your top pair, type, top kicker type hands. So again, I'll restate this. It's The reason it's point one is because it's probably the most important of yeah, this entire video. Small pots with small hands, big pots with big hands. Don't get greedy. Don't get too excited about your over pairs. Play them strong as always, of course, but just know that if you get action uh, by, especially by more than one opponent, you might be in for a real shocker. So keep that in mind always. Uh, top pair, top kicker, over pairs, good hands in general. Depends on your opponents as always, but that is not a quote unquote big hand as such. Big hands, with big hands we mean two pair better. And yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, again here, limped, raised, three bet and four bet pots. We covered in the first video. Next quote for you guys don't go broke in a limped pot. What does that mean? Well, in a limp pot, everybody's range could be up to a hundred percent. Players, especially in late position, will, I mean good players, will very often call any two, any two, on the button or on the cutoff, just to outplay their opponents and, and or flop the miracle, and value bet them to death. So, lint pots with a lot of action, again you need a big hand. What's a big hand? Yes, two pair or better. It's trips, straights, full houses, flushes, whatever. Uh, but at least two pair to continue on against a lot of action in any limp pot. Point three, value maximization. And I've written here how to get it all in by the river or prior to the river even, if you're that strong. In No Limit 100 games, you basically want to sell it when you have it. So what that means is any time you're playing the low and mid limits, you're going to have a lot of fish in general. And you're going to have a lot of calling stations. And you will get paid off a lot um, with your decent hands. So essentially, bluffing goes down in value at the low and mid limits. And value betting, which we'll get here to shortly, goes markedly up in general expected value for your play at those limits. So again, anything in a 100 or lower, sell it when you got it. Especially if you're getting started, don't don't get too crazy with your bluffs. Just play ABC poker straightforward. Um, in position play, as we had mentioned in the first video, as often as possible. And yeah, I'll play your opponents and get active when you do have those strong hands. Generally, avoid confrontations when you're yeah, in 
mediocre or um, vulnerable hand situations. What is slow playing? It means when you flop a monster, and very generally that's going to be a flop set, or two pair again, of course, or the flop flush, although with the flop flush, um, let's say nut flush with the ace, it's not so likely that you get action. But with your flop two pair and your flop sets, also with your not so not so apparent flop straights, say you come into the uh, you come into the pot uh, pre-flop on the button with a suited nine jack. Flop comes seven eight ten rainbow. So that's just an amazing flop for you. Statistically seen, it's about a hundred and yeah, about 100 to 1 against you flopping that. But you do flop it from time to time. And when you do, that's um, that's a really good thing because you're going to get paid off also by any flop set. Okay, You just want to be very certain that when the board pairs and you're on a flush or a straight, that again, you no longer have necessarily a big hand. <laughs> you have a really good hand, but you have a very good vulnerable hand, which, as I mentioned in previous videos, can be very, very costly if your opponent does then at that point have the full house or the four of a kind. Slow play again is when you play your hand weak when you have flopped a monster and you want to bring players into the pot. You want to keep them active in that pot so that you get the maximum payout and slow play is basically check calling uh, somebody bets into you just calling flat uh, checking, you get a, a bet after the fact, a raise after the initial flop better, and you only call that raise so that the initial raise on the flop can then call behind. And then you get a bit more active on the turn depending on what hits. But as I put here in parentheses, almost never slow play on a two-suited or highly connected board. And two suited, by the way, is going to be 60% of all the flops that you'll ever see in Texas Hold'em. So that means three times in five, your flop will be two suited. And that means when you flop your set on a two suited board and you don't protect, if that third suit turns or even rivers again and you haven't improved to a full house, yeah, you can be in serious trouble. So in general, you don't always have to do this, but in general, anytime you see a two-suited board or a highly connected board, you want to protect, which is 0.6 here, but protecting means basically betting so much that your opponents don't have the proper odds to draw with their hand. So if they're on a flush draw, as you well know, for one card, they need pot odds of 19% i.e. 4.2 to 1 on the flop in order to make a call just based on pot odds alone. If they're on a straight draw they need a bit more right approximately yeah, 4.9 but doesn't really matter just say 5 to 1 in order to make that call based on pot odds alone. They can make a lot of other calls if they think they have implied odds as we mentioned in the previous videos you're going to have much greater implied odds in multi-way pots where there are multiple opponents involved and you'll also have much higher implied odds with your straight draws as opposed to your flush draws pretty often most players will freeze up anytime that board is three suited and you can of course use that to your advantage for bluffs etc that's advanced but um, in general players will, especially at the low and mid limits, freeze up most utterly on three suited or, or uh, boards where there are three consecutive ranks, let's say for example 9-10 jack on the flop, um, and especially when it's four consecutive ranks, that means say the queen or the uh, eight comes on the turn, where your opponents only need basically one card for the straight. This kind of stuff, um, these yeah, say four straight boards, three and four suited boards, all that kind of stuff is going to kill action and it's also going to kill your yeah, in most scenarios your implied odds. Again back to slow play. Just in general especially at the low and mid limits 
um, don't do it on two suited boards. You'll, in a couple of the example hands in our final video here, our third video in the sub series, I've got a couple examples where I didn't, where I flopped a set and I didn't protect in order to then push the turn or uh, bet strong on the turn when that third suit or connecting card doesn't hit. That's also playable, that's also something at your disposal. Uh, again, all of this is very table specific, very player specific, and always make your decisions in light of all these different factors that we've covered in multiple videos. But again, as a general rule, slow play only on rainbow non-connected boards when you flop the two pair better. Point five, value betting. This is extracting value from made hands that could be beaten. That means you don't have a lock, you don't have the nuts necessarily. Although you can value bet, of course, with locks and nuts. Yeah, that's just, um, yeah, betting for values, of course, where you think you're better than your opponent or opponents, irrespective of your holding. And you bet it in the hopes that you get paid off. Value betting, when used at higher levels, doesn't mean just betting your nut hands, it doesn't mean just betting your locks, it doesn't mean just betting your second and third nut hands, it also means betting hands when you have good reads on your opponent and you think maybe even your mid pair is good and you bet that for value. This is especially going to be the case when you play um, yeah, six max and even short, yeah, shorter handed games all the way up to heads up. Um, value betting is of course even more important in in these shorthanded types of games. Um, but in general, value betting is just whenever you think you're better, you make a bet in the hopes of getting called. That is an art when you don't have locks, <laughs> when you don't have the nuts, and that's something that really takes a lot of time. It's actually one of the points that really separates exceedingly good players from only good players, this value betting principle. When you can make bets on relatively marginal hands, when you have the best of it. And that, again, is it's a huge topic. That's something that uh, you yourself will, of course, acquire with time uh, via your own experience and something we should definitely address in future videos. But for, for our purposes here, it's not so important. I think I've explained the concept pretty well and hopefully in a few of the example hands that we'll look at in the third video, that'll become clear to you guys. So point six, protection. What is that? Well, very simply put, it is making a bet or raising such that your opponents don't have the correct pot odds to make a call or raise you all in, for example, based on the strength of their hand or their potential draw. And for the exacts on exactly the pot odds that you're giving your opponents, the equity opponents need to break even in the long run, definitely see our video series on Poker Math, The Essentials Made Easy. Uh, there I've covered this topic in pretty great detail. Uh, in general, I've written here, be aware of the odds that you're giving and the potential equity or um, draw that uh, your opponent, he or she, then has. That, in a nutshell, is protection. There are places where you definitely need to protect, i.e., again, <laughs> two suited connected boards <laughs> when you do flop a very strong hand and or turn a very strong hand. And there are other scenarios where you don't need to protect. Let's say where you flop a lock and then the board is two suited. Let's say you flop a full house, for example, which is highly unlikely, but it does happen. And, yeah, the board is two suited and you expect that one of the three players still involved in the pot or in the hand are on let's say a flush or a straight draw or both you want them actually to hit and that would be value maximization in that scenario you don't want to necessarily bet uh, too high unless you think yeah you have okay, history with the player and you think that this player believes that you're uh, complete maniac, for example, that and then he'll re-raise you. That also exists. Um, but in general, you don't want to bet that because you do have three players left in the hand. 
and one or two of them may be on a draw. So what do you want to do? You want to either bet an amount such that they do have the proper odds for the draw and or simply check or check call when there's no need for protection whatsoever. And that goes back then, of course, to slow play. And yeah, these concepts of grouped together, as you see here in the outline, which kind of relate to one another. And yeah, value maximization, slow play is a type of value maximization. Protection and value betting are, of course, also types of value maximization. Um, and yeah, that's, they all kind of go hand in hand, and they are all very much interdependent. This depends a lot on the uh, situation um, you're holding, potential holdings of your opponents, etc., and all that we'll get into in the example hands in the following video. Point seven, pot control. This, as I've written here, is definitely more effective when you are in position, and so-called bluff inducing. As an example, that would be checking behind on the turn. So, pot control is simply um, trying to keep the amount of money in the middle of the table to a minimum because you're either on a draw or you think you're way ahead, way behind, which we'll get into here in the next point, and different other. Yeah, different other factors that you definitely should take into consideration. But pot control is basically when you're trying to, you're not trying to inflate the pot um, as you would be here, for example, with um, slow plays, for example, or value betting on the flop. Um, basically, yeah, getting active on your locks and nut and nut draws. Uh, pot control is the opposite of that. That's basically when you want to, as I just mentioned, not inflate the pot, but keep it relatively small. And again, small pots with small hands, big pots with big hands. You guys being intelligent and upcoming poker stars, you'll figure that out with time. And that, that is something that, um, that you will acquire with experience. But in general, pot control at the low and mid limits, especially on your draws, um, in position, of course, you can get active, uh, and you'll see some advanced moves that I've made in, in the third video, which contradict what I just said, but as a general rule, especially when you're just getting started, pot control is a good way to go when you are on draws, uh, especially when you're in position.